Good morning. It's a pleasure to greet you. I have a couple announcements to start off with. Uh, we will be decorating the church for Advent and Christmas on Friday, November 26, starting at 9 a.m. Please come to help if you are able. And also on Saturday, December 4th, we'll be meeting here at 9.30 to have a meeting to discuss the future of the church. So I hope that everyone who's interested will be here for that. Are there any other announcements that uh, people would share this morning? All right, let us take a few moments and center ourselves for worship. Let us join together in the call to worship from Psalm number two. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord has them in derision. He says, I have set my king on Zion my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and with trembling or you will perish in the way. Happy are all who take refuge in him. Now let us join together in hymn number 110, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, verses 1, 3, and 4.
Now let us gather together with the prayer of confession. Loving God, we confess that we are slow to understand your activity in the world, especially when it involves your gracious redemptive will, as opposed to exercising earthly power. Because of this, we tend to be more outspoken about our earthly allegiances than about our commitment to your spiritual kingdom. Forgive us, we pray. Open our minds and hearts to the wonders of your grace and help us to understand we received a savior instead of merely a political messiah. Help us be ready to recognize Jesus as the ruler of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ came to overturn the corrupt powers and principalities of the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Now let us join together in hymn number 73, O Worship the King, verses 1, 2, and 5. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. May we be blessed by the hearing and understanding of the word this morning.
Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is Christ the King Sunday. So today we'll, we will be looking at what kind of king Jesus was. Here Jesus has been arrested and taken before the ultimate power in the region, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, on charges of sedition. Pilate, no doubt, views this itinerant preacher from a backwater town as nothing but an irritant to be dealt with. He may be somewhat curious about the case due to the people involved and the charges levied against him, but I doubt he thinks very much of this silly religious squabble. Were it not for such an unsettled time of the year with so many Jews returning to Jerusalem for the Passover, the case might have even been laughable. This guy doesn't even seem to have a militant following. But charges of sedition as have been brought against Jesus must be taken somewhat seriously. There can be no power on earth that can be allowed to oppose Rome. Rather than being cowed by being in the presence of the personification of Roman power itself, Jesus handles himself as one with authority, turning the tables and questioning Pilate, rather than just answering his questions. Jesus could have merely responded with a, a yes or a no to Pilate's question, are you the king of the Jews? But Jesus wants to dig a little deeper into Pilate's motivation for the question. What is he thinking? Has he already made up his mind? This is not an innocent question. And under the circumstances, it is a very loaded one. Do you ask this on your own, or have others told you about me? Are you really interested in knowing, or have you bought into the lies of the chief priests? I imagine that Pilate was surprised by Jesus' response, for people were usually much more deferential around him, and especially before him in such circumstances. And Pilate seems maybe a little bit defensive. He replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Why are your own people turning you over to me for trial and punishment as the earthly power in these parts? Well, Jesus decides to show what Pilate what true power and authority is all about. And in answering, he tries to frame things in a way that Pilate might be able to understand, comparing it to earthly power and dominion. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting me to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Yes, there it is. A confession. Sort of. Maybe. Wait. Not of this world? What does that mean? What other world is there? Pilate asked him, so you are a king? What kind of kingdom is not of this world? And frankly, what fun would that be? Earthly kingdoms are where the fun stuff is. Just ask Caesar. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king because that's what they told you but clearly you have no understanding. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. 
everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And you, Pilate, could not handle my truth because you do not know the ultimate truth, the truth that transcends the power of this world. But then, why would you? The chief priests don't even get it, and they were raised in the knowledge of my father and his will that people live lives of freedom and justice. In fact, they were rescued from bondage in Egypt and delivered here to this promised land, and they still don't get it. So how could you, a Roman, you are all just on this petty power trip. Stick around, pilot. I'll show you what true leadership and power is all about. You clearly have no idea and you will never belong to the truth. Just your own little version of the truth. You believe that those that control the earthly power win. Well, Maybe so for a while, but not in the end. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his soul? Perhaps in a few years you can tell me about that, Pilot. Reverend Brett Blair tries to frame some of the earthly power of Christ Church in ways that we can relate to today in terms of business and marketing. Because that's what the church is all about, right? Getting market share. Market experts are quick to tell startup businesses how important it is to develop a corporate logo. Brand identity, they call it. Think about it one symbol that can readily identify a billion dollar organization. The ultimate goal of any designer when creating a logo is to develop a mark that identifies the company, but also persuades viewers to respond in a specific way. Logos. So what makes a good logo? There are five things that most marketing agencies agree make a good logo. The first is simplicity. Is it easy to look at with minimal moving pieces? And second is brand consistency. Does it fit your company's overall message? Memorability. Is it easy for customers to recall? Which leads to repeat customers and word of mouth advertising. Four, remarkability. Will it cut through the clutter of your industry and say who you are? And five, market testing. Don't trust your gut. It should be thoroughly market tested and proven. But what does all this have to say to religious organizations? I mean, it sounds like it's too worldly an approach, right? But I have to say that I agree. The same holds true for us. A picture is worth a thousand words after all. Around the spiritual dimensions of our lives, we can be consistently and powerfully moved by a single sign or symbol. For the Jewish people, it's the Star of David. For the Buddhists, it's the figure of their enlightened teacher sitting in a cross-legged position. And for us as Christians, the central logo of our life, and perhaps the greatest logo ever created, 
for any business or organization is the envy of every marketing expert. It's so powerful that it carries the meaning of all that we know here as humans upon this earth, suffering. But it also embodies hope and the promises of love, reconciliation, and forgiveness. It creates no confusion, it belongs to one worldwide movement. No one for 2,000 years has tried to steal it and use it for their own ideas. It stands for defeat, yet it stands for victory. And yet, given all this, it's so simple that a child can create it with two sticks. It's the cross, the sacred sign of God's sacrifice offered through Christ Jesus. What a logo, huh? It's simple. It's consistent with our mission statement. It is memorable. Off the charts memorable, isn't it? It's created great word of mouth and repeat customers. Remarkable. It certainly cuts through all the clutter. How can it not with all the events that have surrounded it? And we've been market testing it for over 2000 years. Would you say that it passed the market test? This is our marketing plan, our movement's logo. And through it, we are continually reminded of God's undying love for the world and of our call to love and serve one another throughout the course of our earthly existence. It's a tremendous logo, but unfortunately, sometimes the main message, the why of Christ's movement, gets lost in all the marketing. Sometimes the church gets too caught up in fancy buildings with lots of butts in the seats on Sunday to focus on the true mission, creating disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. It's not about huge congregations sitting in the church on Sunday. Christ didn't even have a church building. Heck, he wasn't even welcomed in the temple because he clearly didn't get the whole full in line with the errant existing powers that be thing. He was one of those troublemaking reformers and the church doesn't want those. Temple Judaism sold out to the whole earthly power trip. Just give us your offerings and nobody gets hurt or saved. Nobody's life really gets changed. Just keep going through the motions as you have been and it will all be all right. As long as there's gold in the temple treasury, And if we can keep those pesky prophets quiet. What is the Church of Christ all about? Until we can truly answer that, the Church will continue to decline. Because Christ came in the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to his voice. And Christ's truth makes us free indeed in this world, but not of this world. I think sometimes even the church forgets that. May we be true disciples of Christ, filled with the truth of God's sacrificial love 
and the example of Christ's faithful servant leadership. That is the truth and the power of God that goes beyond the power of this world, beyond the power of Pilate or Caesar, and into the service of God's kingdom of justice and righteousness, so that all people can share in the abundance of God's beautiful creation. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Now let us join together in the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we come into our time of together. For those of you at home, please let me know how we can pray for you by emailing your prayer requests to pastor at winfieldumc.org. Does anyone have joys or concerns that they would share this morning? Well, we are approaching the Thanksgiving holiday and there will be many people on the road going to see loved ones. So let us Keep those who are traveling in our prayers to receive God's traveling mercies. I lift up the joy of Eric, who is at home now, recovering from brain cancer and able to see his four-year-old son. Lift up John's uncle Tom, who is experiencing breathing problems following lung cancer treatment. And also Ern's sister-in-law, Betty, who is having pacemaker surgery on the 29th. Marie said that she is having some reactions to her medication, so they are dealing with that. So let us keep her in our prayers. And also Shirley and her nerves. Found out that Janet, is out of St. Mary's Hospital and near home being treated at the Windsor Park Clinic. Now she is confined to a wheelchair for the moment. So let us keep her in our prayers as well. Let us take these joys and concerns and those that yet remain upon our hearts to the one who's Grace, grace and strength are sufficient. Let us pray. Lord, we live in troubling and unsettled times. We are surrounded by uncertainty in every corner. We need to know your truth and to cling to your cross and your example to guide us through this world of false power and false prophets. Help us to listen to the truth of your words as found in the scripture and to follow the guidings of your spirit in our lives. Lord, help us to reach out to those encounter each day and to Greet them with peace and hope 
and your love. Help us to treat them with compassion and to see them the way you do as your beloved people. Lord, we pray that you will heal our environment and help us to get your kingdom here in this world back into normal, back to the weather patterns that you established so that we may once again be self-sustaining. Help us to follow the example of Christ Jesus as the guidepost for our lives, whose prayer we now pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come into our time of offering. Thank those who continue to mail in their offerings and also those who text their offerings. There is a plate in the narthex to receive your offerings as you exit. Now let us dedicate our gifts. Lord, you call us to share your truth and love with a fallen world. Accept these gifts for your work of truth and justice here in this world. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Now let us prepare to sing our closing hymn, number 580, Lead On, O King Eternal.
Now, as we go forth into the world this week, may we take the love and peace of Christ into our hurting world. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.